Welcome to On Our Watch, a podcast about coastal erosion and sustainability in Louisiana. My name is Marion Evans. I'm a filmmaker and a producer of the documentary On Our Watch, a feature-length film that examines Louisiana's coastal land loss crisis and the ways in which it impacts our communities, industries, and culture. The film's director, Jonathan Evans, and I are proud to produce this podcast series that will continue to explore issues facing the Louisiana coast through conversations with local residents, community leaders, and experts. In this episode, we're speaking with Bo Jones. Bo is the president and CEO of the Water Institute, an independent nonprofit applied research organization that works across disciplines to advance science and solve complex environmental and societal challenges. And now, our interview with Bo Jones. Thank you for joining us today, Bo. So to start, I was wondering if you could tell us about how you got into coastal work and how you got involved with the Water Institute. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm originally from Rust, uh, Ruston, Louisiana, grew up in North Louisiana, but I spent a whole lot of time in South Louisiana hunting and fishing and, um, you know, paddling around the marsh and had family from uh, Opelousas uh, and Lafayette and Franklin on the Bayou Teche. Uh, so spent a lot of time um, down here. And so, um, you know, I grew up in, in a pretty weird family for North Louisiana that, you know, our dinner table conversations were talking about game fish designations for uh, uh, redfish and how to stop gill netting and, um, you know, what was going on with the Carnarvon diversion. These were conversations I remember as a as a kid growing up in Ruston, which was pretty different from everybody around me. So it was always something that was really interesting to me and spent a lot of time in, you know, Louisiana Sportsman's Paradise. I spent some time out on the East Coast um, and did undergrad there. And then like many people, um, you know, who were either here or not here um, for Katrina, it was a very impactful uh, series of moments. And for me, being away, I was interested in environmental law and environmental science. And Katrina hit and I hightailed it back home, Um, came back to law school at LSU and got out of law school right as the oil spill was uh, spewing and joined uh, the Louisiana Attorney General's office uh, oil spill team and environmental uh, team. And so that's kind of how I uh, got into this. So, Great. And then, um, you know, with the Water Institute, um, again, I'm a, I do environmental law and environmental policy. Um, I'm not a scientist. I can say that I'm science adjacent. Um, <laughs> I'm a big birder, um, but I, uh, I'm not a scientist. So I, I come at this from the environmental law and policy side of it, which is obviously critical um, to what we're dealing with in Louisiana and across the Gulf Coast um, and across the world, really. And so um, I did a lot of work at the Attorney General's office on uh, coastal protection and restoration and coastal management and Department of Natural Resources, wildlife and fisheries. Um, DEQ, uh, and so came in it, uh, from from that angle, and then knew about the Water Institute when it was being founded. Um, watched it uh, kind of get started. Um, was out in private practice working in coastal and environmental law in New Orleans, um, and got to know a lot of the people at the institute, including my predecessor Justin Aaronworth, and um, you know just started a conversation and said, "Well, I think this is where I, I need to be." So I've been here for about five years. So. Great, very nice. Thank you. And so can you tell me a little bit about what the Water Institute is and how it works and some of your primary research areas? Yeah. So, you know, the Water Institute, um, you know, in my kind of North Louisiana analingo, sometimes I call it a football bat. It's a it's a strange organization, um, but it's one that is it it is it is distinct by design. Right. It is it is not like anything we see. Um, in this space uh, locally, and and that's intentional, and it's not um, that's not a hierarchical thing. It is that the Water Institute exists to fill a role and to blend roles that are are, are not always um, filled. And so, you know, technically we're an independent nonprofit applied research organization um, that is is headquartered here in Louisiana, strategically in Louisiana, because we are canaries in the coal mine for many issues. Um, but we we have an international and an, and national mindset in terms of, you know, how can we find solutions to problems? How can we, um, you know, find the most cutting edge research and technology? So um, the Water Institute has has uh, changed a lot since its founding. You know, initially, if you would have said, what does the Water Institute do? do? It does, and it did independent applied research to help the state of Louisiana um, tackle the coastal challenge. 
primarily helping with the coastal master planning process from 2012 to, to today. Um, the Water Institute still does and a lot of work and a lot of partnership with the state of Louisiana and the federal government around Louisiana specific coastal issues, but we also do a lot more. So um, our primary research areas, um, they are many and, and multifaceted, but, but really where you find us is where there are complex decisions with a lot of different stakeholders um, that have complex uh, night science involved in it, right? So that are issues like Louisiana's Coastal uh, Restoration and Protection Challenge, that are issues like um, the Cap uh, Capital Area Groundwater Commission and the Southern Hills Aquifer in Baton Rouge, right? Where you've got many, many stakeholders around a really complex set of, you know, hydrology and geology and, um, and, and, and social science. Um, and uh, that's, that's really where we like to dive in. And so to do that, we have a team of, um, you know, everything from, you know, we're sitting in, you know, one of our head applied geosciences offices right now, all the way to great social scientists like Scott Himmerling, um, all the way to artificial intelligence and machine learning, to, um, you know, in, incredible avian biologists, uh, to lawyers, to policy wonks. So we kind of run the gamut there. Yeah. Kind of a nexus of a lot of different things. Exactly. So I wanted to talk to you about the New Orleans Stormwater Project that you guys have going on. So what is that project all about and how is it impacting the city's approach to stormwater management? Yeah, that's a really exciting, um, a, a really exciting project. <clears throat> and one, you know, we, we used to always joke, um, in, particularly in New Orleans, because there's so many fantastic people working uh, in the New Orleans urban resilience space, starting back with, you know, um, uh, the, the most recent drainage king, as Rich Campanella calls him, with, you know, David Wagner and the, the urban water plan that Ganoff was so instrumental in. And so many people have played a large role that, you know, the Water Institute sitting here where we are right now, strategically near the banks of, uh, or the mouth of Bayou St. John on Lake Pontchartrain, which is, you know, one of the, the focal points of, of Bienville's, you know, charge to create the city of New Orleans, right? So we're here in the midst of all this, but oftentimes we used to joke, well, we're, we're big in Tokyo, right? The Water Institute does a lot in a lot of places, but we weren't working a lot in New Orleans. And that was also by design because there's a lot of great people uh, doing work here. But there was an opportunity a couple years ago where um, actually some uh, investment came in from, um, you know, one of the big employers in town, which is Shell, and said, hey, we want to do something important for an area where we have assets. And we said, well, you know, stormwater is one that's a real big issue and you have tremendous assets in New Orleans. Would you mind us taking a look at this? They said, absolutely. So we worked with the Sewage and Water Board um, and got access to one of the Sewage and Water Board's models. And one of the um, interesting things, and I'm going to try not to get out over my skis as a, as a scientist, but, you know, Modeling is something that works really well um, when your uncertainties are, are, are somewhat limited, where you can say, if we do this and, and we predict these changes, then this is what might happen in the future. But as you start to factor in um, the non-stationarity of climate change and, and, and all of these different vari vari you know, variable factors that, that are changing and, and you don't really know by how much and you don't really know uh, when and how, um, it starts to make prediction of the future really, really hard, right? And so whereas, you know, the traditional model of, you know, predict then act, like here's what we think is going to happen in the future and then let's plan for it. We think that if we open up a diversion in the Mississippi River and, you know, let sediment and fresh water flow through it, then this is what's going to happen in the future. But what if everything was uncertain. We didn't know where the diversion was going to be. We didn't know how high the water or the sediment was going to be, you know, at a, at a certain time and all of these different factors, which some of that uncertainty is in coastal modeling. But then you take rainfall and then you take infrastructure and then you take pumps and electrical challenges. The uncertainties start to, you know, the, the fish starts to swallow the whale there. And so this New Orleans stormwater project um, starts with the premise of we can't predict the future right? With climate change, this is going to be, a, you know, we, we can't predict it. So what are we going to do? Let's try and take various scenarios that we can do across uh, the basin and say, what happens if we do this? And then let's stress test that scenario. Let's stress test another scenario. So it's a really exciting, and you know, um, project centered around a, a, a frame of thought called uh, decision making under deep uncertainty, DMDU. Um, and so it takes traditional stormwater modeling, 
It takes, you know, hydrology and geology and subsidence factors and, and weather and climate factors. But then it says, we can't predict anything. So let's flip it all on its end and let's try and, and predict different scenarios. So that's the core of this project. And it's really, really exciting because what we're excited about from, from the Water Institute's perspective is, you know, we're not, we're not solving any one problem. There are you know, gobs and gobs of incredibly talented A&E firms and, and city and state political subdivisions that are looking at this. But we're hoping by looking at, you know, stress testing some of these scenarios and looking at the modeling a little bit differently that we might be able to help um, decision makers make decisions based a little bit more on, on the probabilities that, that, that they may see in the future. Cool, and so where does that stand now? Has the city of New Orleans incorporated that into their decision making? Yeah, so you know we've had a great uh, series of conversations with um, you know to back up a little bit the the modeling is we're we're kind of pulling it all together. The end we've run a lot of models. I mean, for instance, we took Hurricane Harvey and we sat Hurricane Harvey on top of the city of New Orleans and said, what would happen? What would happen if all the pumps worked? What would happen if none of the pumps worked? What would happen if these pumps worked? What would happen if these didn't? What would happen if all of the catch basins were clogged, but the pumps were working perfectly? You know, so looked at all these different scenarios. So yeah, the city has been very engaged in the conversation, both the city and the sewage and water board. We've sat and talked through a lot of the, um, the models and, and, and some of the uh, results. Um, I'm really encouraged that they're gonna, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know that they are going to, you know, pull them in and say, we're going to make these recommendations, um, uh, you know, happen. But what we hope will happen is that the city, as they're planning the next phase of, you know, urban stormwater, the urban water at 10 program just went on. And as they're looking through some of these big green infrastructure projects, but also just what I would call, sorry for the sports reference, but the blocking and tackling, right? Let's make sure our catch basins are clean. Let's make sure the conveyance channels uh, are open. Let's make sure the pumps are operational. Let's make sure the power uh, is there. Because that's one of the things that this modeling and this work that, that we've done um, uh, shows is that while big green infrastructure you know, projects, the Mirabeau Gardens and, and these big mega projects are super impactful and, and, and a green infrastructure strategy across the city of New Orleans would be transformative, but they're also really expensive. And we know now, 10 years later, after the urban water plan, they take time. And, and, and that's not anybody's fault, they just take time. Um, but what are the what value can we find from from the blocking and tackling? If we keep our catch basins cleaned, if we make sure the pumps have power, if we understand um, how impactful that is, that's what we're really trying to give the city is to say the city and sewage water board to say, yeah, we could do all these things, um, these big big mega things. But what about the blocking and tackling? And then how important is that? Because one of the critical pieces um, in this whole analysis is rather than just talking about flood depths or hydrographs and the water's gonna get this high or subsidence is gonna go this low, we've actually taken a structure overlay of the city of New Orleans to say, okay, what structures are here? Um, and pioneering with uh, some work from uh, universities around the country to try and you know, kind of um, ground truth uh, flood depths to say, okay, if the map showed that we're gonna have heavy flooding here, how much damage is that gonna be? What, what are we talking about in the billions of dollars, right? So we're able to not just say, well, you would get you know, one foot across the city or three feet in this area, but to say you would have this much damage to people's homes, this much damage to, um, uh, to different structures. So that's one of the really interesting things that we're excited about is that what we try and do overwhelmingly is help decision makers, whether that's a state, a uh, state government, a federal government, an industry, a company, an NGO that has a really complex de decision, how they can use the best available science, that's physical, social, you know, computer science, how they can use that to make better decisions. So that's what we hope can happen with this project. Very cool, it's super interesting. Um, so another issue that I know the Water Institute is working on that I wanted to ask you about is blue carbon um, and quantifying its potential benefits for the coast. So first of all, can you explain for our listeners what blue carbon is and tell us about the work that you guys are doing with that? Yeah, absolutely, I'd be happy to. So, you know, blue carbon, this is, um, um, I, I will try and avoid the science as, as best I can, right? But um, there is a very large um, to the tune of two plus billion dollars a year in voluntary carbon credits that are sold um, internationally. 
these carbon credits are generated and they're also called carbon offsets, right? Is that if you as an emitter, whether that's as a, a company or a country or a state have emissions that you cannot reduce, um, uh, you know, at the site or reduce um, on your own, there is um, a, a somewhat controversial um, idea that you can then offset that by making investments or, 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 or taking action in another place or in another situation that reduces um, emissions and so you can offset that. So that is the whole, you know, kind of big picture international carbon market. That is a, to the tune of about $2 billion a year right now. You can get carbon credits um, for basically two general activities. You can either avoid future emissions or you can pull emissions out of the atmosphere, right? And so in those two, um, you know, kind of general dog legs of the, of the chart, you get carbon capture utilization and storage and planting forest and not cutting down forests and direct air capture and the whole and, and energy efficiency upgrades and all of these different strategies to reduce carbon. Um, blue carbon is is using, it is a nature-based idea, so it is using photosynthesis, right? We all learn this, even not being a scientist, I, you know, can, can figure that out, right? So using the process that, you know, plants do to live and survive, um, to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, hold that in their roots, in their biomass, bring it into the soil, that process. It's the same process that's used for carbon credits on a forest. The difference is, is that rather than using it in a fixed habitat like a terrestrial forest in Iowa, say, um, we're trying to apply those same principles to a very dynamic ecosystem um, where the land meets the sea, right, in this, in this blue zone. So blue carbon can be ocean-based, right? There are strategies out in the deep ocean, and then it can also be uh, more land-based, seagrass, kelp forests, mangroves, um, uh, um, you know, herbaceous marshes. And so that's what we're trying to look at in Louisiana. And the reason is, and so kind of backing up a little bit, the state of Louisiana is spending you know north of one billion dollars a year on coastal protection and restoration right we have a 50 year 50 billion dollar coastal master plan one of the problems is that we have a funding runway to about 2031 we talk about this in the coastal you know sphere as like the dreaded fiscal cliff right so 2031 a lot of the oil spill money that is paying for a lot of this work um, is is uh, goes away um, and so where are we going to find revenue and where are we going to find resources to continue the momentum of protecting communities um, and rehabilitating habitats along coastal Louisiana? So that's where this conversation came up is that is there a way to leverage these international carbon markets um, and, and use the process of building and protecting marsh in Louisiana to generate resources for not just the coastal program, but all the private landowners that own, some say 80% of coastal Louisiana, right? So is there a way to monetize and to revalue uh, coastal Louisiana? So that's kind of the, the big picture. And I'll give a couple, um, or, or one key fact and figure, which is that estimates say that one acre of Louisiana marshes sequester 80x the, uh, uh, an equivalent acre in a terrestrial forest. So a $2 billion voluntary carbon market is built almost primarily off, you know, either not cutting down forests or uh, planting new forests. And habitats in Louisiana sequester 80x the carbon. Now, that's not without risk, right? They also, um, you know, marshes emit methane in certain uh, conditions. How much methane? That's one of the questions we're trying to figure out because methane is also a very potent greenhouse gas. But then also, um, you know, the, the carbon markets are built on permanence, right? You got to you got to sequester that carbon for a long time in order for it to be, you know, um, in, in order for an offset to be sold off of it. Well, um, we we can look at the models and we can look at, um, you know, the, the, the projections in the future of coastal Louisiana. Um, and it's hard to say what pe blade of grass is going to be there 20 years from now, much less 100 years from now. So the dynamism of coastal Louisiana is one of the things that makes it tough. But, you know, so, so the genesis of the blue carbon idea and thinking about this, and it's been going on for decades, research into the space by, you know, LSU and the USGS and, um, you know, researchers at the Water Institute and, and many other places have been trying to figure out how much carbon does coastal Louisiana sequester and how much methane does it emit and for how long. But 
even if we ignore carbon markets, right? Even if we ignore the potential for, you know, a fungible carbon coin that could be sold um, to, to, you know, fund coastal Louisiana um, protection and restoration, um, there's still value to figuring this out, right? Because let's not forget that one of the reasons that, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the marshlands and wetlands in the United States were divested from the federal government um, and, and made available for private development and private use was because we said they're invaluable, right? All they are, are hotbeds of malaria and alligators, and we, we don't need them. Let's, you know, go and drain the swamp and, and build uh, development on them. And um, while that led to a lot of, you know, the places that we're sitting on right now, I mean, we're literally on, um, you know, the, the uh, reclaimed bed of Lake Pontchartrain, right? Um, but uh, that, you know, it, it, it operates under a, under a fallacy of, you know, that marsh are only valuable for their development potential or only valuable for their trapping potential or only valuable for their oil and gas potential. Um, there are a lot of um, uh, stacked values in uh, coastal Louisiana that sometimes we don't account for. Um, sometimes we as coastal users don't account for and sometimes you know, the federal government when calculating a benefit cost analysis of a project may not account for the full value. So even if we never sell a carbon coin, understanding um, how much carbon is sequestered in Louisiana is gonna be critically important for justifying the existence of, uh, of, of South Louisiana. To say, look, we need to stay here because we are one of the carbon sinks for the country, right? We contain a considerable amount of the wetlands for the United States. And if the wetlands are the carbon sinks that science seems to suggest that they are, um, then it's more valuable than maybe the rest of the world gives us credit for. That's really interesting. Um, so as someone with a strong legal background like yours, how important would you say the role of law plays in coastal issues in Louisiana and beyond Louisiana? Yeah, I mean, um, our legal system in Louisiana is, I mean, it's a fun one to kind of grow up in and, and learn, right? I mean, you know, um, the Napoleonic Code and, um, you know, the Spanish law and the uh, and, and the French law and the Roman law all converging on this muddy little place. Um, it's, it's fun to really learn. But, you know, I uh, have, have long um, been a proponent of um, lawyers in Louisiana really understanding um, the substance of the coastal challenge. Um, because the coastal challenge, as I just talked about with Blue Carbon, um, the coastal challenge is not just, you know, it, 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 is, it matters a lot. Uh, to the city, you know, to the community of Lafitte, uh, the Coastal Challenge. But what we sometimes fail to recognize is it mat matters to the entire fisc of the state, it matters to people in Ruston, and it matters to the rest of the country what happens in coastal Louisiana. And so um, I think it's critical that at baseline, Louisiana lawyers understand um, the dynamism of our coast and the changing and the fluid, the fluid nature of our property regime, regimes and our property rights. Um, but also, you know, what you've seen in terms of the progress that you've seen in coastal Louisiana that frankly outkicks, you know, many, many areas around the world in terms of true progress in ecosystem restoration and community protection that rivals, I dare say it rivals the Dutch. Um, and in terms of ecosystem protection and ecosystem uh, restoration, um, it, you know, the, what is in the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan is, is really second to none. That all started with really bold steps at the Louisiana legislature after Hurricane Katrina to say, we need to rethink the way that we prioritize this thing. So we reorganized Louisiana government and said, we need to have a single focus and we need to have an entity that's responsible for looking at our coastal challenge. At, at the time that CPRA and, and the state agencies, or, or the state of Louisiana really dove into the coastal challenge, the coastal issues were dealt with in five, six, seven different agencies and you know political subdivisions and federal bodies. And so that consolidation and that rethinking of focus under Louisiana law was critical to Louisiana capturing um, uh, the opportunity. And I and I pause there to say um, to talk about something that that I didn't in talking about the Water Institute, which is that I we talk a lot about the risk and the challenges of living in coastal Louisiana and oh, the challenges of the Mississippi River and salt wedges and floods and all of these things. And they are challenges, no question. They are challenges for communities. They're the, you know, um, even more challenges for the least of us. Um, and, and 
<laughs> that is something that we have to be mindful of. But what we recognized, and Katrina was really one of the moments that that you know showed a lot of people this, um, is, is that in this risk and this challenge and this pain that comes with our relationship to water, there's tremendous opportunity. There's tremendous intellectual opportunity. There's tremendous um, economic opportunity, governance opportunities to really rethink the way we do things. So Louisiana can, yes, conserve and protect and, and prevent the water from coming onto its shores. That's, 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 we absolutely should do that. But we also need to fight back with more and say, we want our universities, we want our economic engines, we want our companies, uh, we want our cultures to not just be resilient and bounce back, we want them to thrive. And so that started with um, a lot of the rethinking of our legal framework in Louisiana around you know, coastal protection and restoration and how we deal with water. And there's more of that on the horizon. You know, the Louisiana Law Institute is rethinking the entire water code um, or, or rethinking, you know, thinking about having a water code for the state of Louisiana. So I think that all of these things that seem like challenges and risk, and, and they are all those things, but they are all tremendous opportunities um, to, to then turn around and say, okay, let's take this risk. Let's take this canary in the coal mine and let's go be leaders for the Gulf Coast. Let's go be leaders for the world. We've done that in sciences, starting with all of our universities and our A&E firms and our um, environmental NGOs. The Water Institute, I hope, has played a role in that. But then, you know, our legal structures, our political subdivisions, our governance, all of those things. I mean, people from South Carolina and Virginia are coming to Louisiana to say, how did you set this up? How are you doing this? People, I hosted a delegation six months ago from Singapore saying, okay, we're now thinking about the challenges we have on the coast. How have y'all done this? Starting with the science, with the governance, with the law, with the policy, how have you done this? So, I mean, we in Louisiana are not just responding and not just being resilient. You know, the, the, the dreaded R word, we are trying to thrive. And that's what the Water Institute stands for. That's why we are here. Um, and it's not just us doing it. It's not just us that are responsible for this. It's trying to help uh, foster the ecosystem for all of us to respond to these challenges. That's a really good way of putting it. I feel like in order to create lasting change and make it permanent, it, it has to be through the law. So you do need lawyers. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and Lastly, I wanted to ask if you had any upcoming projects or future initiatives that you're particularly excited about with the Water Institute. Oh man, I, it, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot. Um, you know, the, you mentioned blue carbon. We're um, about to lead a workshop on um, uh, creating a network of researchers and policy thinkers around uh, the Northern Gulf Coast um, on blue carbon. That's something I'm really excited for. Um, also. You know, one of the things I'm most excited for is the Water Institute in the early days of its founding was was here and 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 helped the state of Louisiana um, set up a lot of the you know coastal master planning process. What I am really excited on where we are headed in the future is how can we then take all of the opportunity and all of the projects that we've been had an opportunity to work on over the last 12 years, then how can we make sure that we're translating that and how and make sure that we are elevating, as I said earlier, the ecosystem around us, right? So so um, the data and model repository, this is this super wonky thing that has been talked about since you know, 2010 in the early days of, of, of scheming um, to create this thing, the, the, the Water Institute, right? It's creating um, a, a, a open access repository for all the models and data files so that researchers and A&E firms and, um, and government officials can, can tap into to make sure that we are all playing with the same deck of cards. The most um, uh, you know, techno technologically forward models, the best available data. Um, so we are leading a lot of efforts. We're working with the state of Louisiana to create a data model repository. Um, we're working with Nichols. Um, and uh, several folks around uh, Port Fouchon to create a living laboratory that will have an information hub so that you know researchers and community members alike can tap into to figure out what has been done, what is working, um, what is not working, um, how can we mimic um, uh, you know projects in the future. So really um, leaning into open data and open science is something I'm really excited about. And it, because look, we have a single metric at the Institute, and that is having an impact, using science and technology and policy and thought leadership to have an impact in our community and communities beyond. There is a lot of work to be done, 
And no matter if we're 80 people or 800 people, um, we can't do it all ourselves. So it is critical that we figure out how to do the best science that we can, the best policy thought that we can, but then make sure that what we do is scalable and usable and translatable to people that they can then take it um, and, and make a snowball out of it. So other researchers piggybacking off of us and vice versa, um, other community groups taking ideas um, that may have been developed somewhere before us and, and then we refine them and then those community groups taking them and, and having an impact in those community. Somebody taking a piece of technology that we helped develop for the Army Corps of Engineers and then taking it and deploying it to something we never thought about. That's when that's when we are being successful, when um, the projects and, and the policy lanes and the things that we think and work on here are getting a life of their own outside of the Water Institute and we're finding out about them um, you know, down the road. We just um, did something with the avian, uh, try, a, we call it the avian monitoring dashboard, which is trying to look at um, what is the impact of the oil spill on colonial nesting birds on barrier islands across the Gulf. And it's a super high tech, you know, they were flying over with cameras. We used AI and ML to figure out where the nesting birds were and what type they were. But then one of the critical things that we did is rather just having a spreadsheet so researchers can look at we worked with partners to build a dashboard that anybody in the country can tap into and say, hey, we're royal, nesting, royal terns nesting um, along you know, coastal Alabama. Um, and then pulling that data, and we have seen already independent researchers and people with no affiliation to the Water Institute or any of the partners tapping into that data set, um, comparing it to other data sets to figure out what they can, what, what they can find. That is the area where I'm most excited um, because we, we have a tremendous opportunity at the Water Institute to work with you know, the federal government, the Army Corps of Engineers, the state of Louisiana, all the state uh, departments, the city of New Orleans and cities in Jacksonville, Mobile, um, Houston, but really getting down and working with the communities and, and right-sizing um, answers and questions um, for communities and places that need it the most, that's what we wanna be a conduit to. And so that need, we, we need more people than just ourselves. And so trying to figure out how we can scale um, thought and, and thought leadership and scale technology um, and, and scale um, uh, scientific you know, solutions, that is what we, we really wanna see happen in the future. Yeah, I love that. It's awesome to be able to share that with as many people as possible. So thank you so much for Great. joining us today, Bo. I really appreciate it. It's, it's an honor. Thank you so much for what y'all are doing. Thank you for listening to On Our Watch. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Bo Jones. Don't forget to subscribe to On Our Watch on your favorite podcast app to be notified about future episodes. You can also watch a video version of this podcast on YouTube, which you can find a link to in the description. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back with another episode next week. This podcast is made possible through grant funds from the Greater New Orleans Foundation and executive produced by Bruno UK Steiner. <laughs>